Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I'm Tara Sonnenschein, Executive Vice President here at the U.S. Institute of Peace, and I know many of you have been here for a long day, so I have both the pleasure and the burden of introducing the third panel, and I say burdensome only because I know that it is 3.20 on Thursday, and you're beginning to think about the long weekend ahead. So my real job is to keep you awake and animated. And to do that, I want to very quickly say that this panel is going to move us from theory into action, into the practical initiatives and paths forward that take all the wonderful ideas you've heard today and begin to really open the floor. So I'm going to do very little today except get our speakers up here, and I've asked them all to very quickly trim and start Xing out lines in their remarks so that we can get to questions uh, very quickly. You have the bios of these very, very brilliant speakers. If you think everything has been said this morning and this afternoon, you're not correct, because there is a great deal more to be heard from them. So what I'm going to do is quickly tell you, as you can see, who everybody is, and then they're going to come up in succession uh, without anything in between. So buckle your seatbelts as we move quickly. I do want to also say that you're all invited to the tribute and reception that will be coming up. I don't know what we're serving, Abby, at the reception. Do you? Good stuff. I'm trying to think of all the possible incentives to keep you here. Um, so with that, let me just tell you that, of course, we have with us Dr. Edward Luck, currently serving as UN Secretary General Special Advisor. He's done everything in the world, IPA, UN Association, on and on. Heather Conley is here, and I'm delighted that she is here. She serves as director and senior fellow at the Europe program at CSIS. She's been at the State Department. She's done everything you can imagine. Um, everything. No, well, you know, it's late in the day, and we said there's good stuff coming, so she hasn't done everything yet. I don't know how to go after that. Um, I think we went a little bit out of order, but that's okay. Ambassador John Herbst, I am not going to read his bio because that would take the rest of the afternoon. Um, all very just incredible places, and we know him most from Coordinator for Reconstruction and Stabilization uh, at the Senior Foreign Service, member of the Senior Foreign Service. Our own Lawrence Wucher, who, in addition to everything you would read about him, it does not say that he returned recently from how many days at the Auschwitz conference? Eight or something? I was there. A few days, and a very interesting prevention conference that I hope he will reflect on. And lastly, Peter, I've told him already I am not going to get the Dutch correct on von Tool. 50 percent, okay. but we agreed, Peter, for now. Um, so with that, I'm going to begin to let the speakers come up, do their remarks, and then very quickly we will turn to all of you for the Q&A. Thanks for hanging in there with us all day. Uh, thank you, Tara. Uh, it's a great pleasure to be here, although I have some second thoughts after that introduction. <laughs> uh, but I, I will try to be brief. Uh, it's a great honor to be here with David Homburg, who I think invented or reinvented uh, prevention, uh, and with uh, uh, Avi, who's done so much uh, with the UN itself on these issues. Um, let me just say that uh, for the UN, uh, prevention is really second nature. I mean, any organization that would be so bold or so foolish uh, in its opening preamble to say that uh, it is trying to save succeeding generations from the scourge of war, uh, the words added by Virginia Gildersleeve, the dean from uh, Barnard, uh, has to be one that has prevention in its blood. If you look at the very first purpose in Article 1.1, uh, it is uh, about prevention 
as the first tool in terms of maintaining international peace and security. Uh, and as Ambassador Yates said this morning, way back then, uh, that uh, the very fact that we haven't had World War III in many ways confirms the fundamental purpose uh, of the organization. And I think besides the charter, and you see so many things in Chapter 6 and 8 in particular, but elsewhere uh, about uh, things that deal with prevention, uh, but in addition, the very comparative advantages of this institution, and sometimes it's hard to remember that there are some, uh, but there actually are some that would tend to go in the directions of prevention. Uh, the very universality of the organization, the sense that in some cases it brings a certain legitimacy that other bodies can't, uh, can be a particular advantage. Uh, the fact that it has some distance, it's not a regional organization, it's not the neighbors. At least originally the idea of peacekeeping itself was supposed to have uh, uh, distant peacekeepers from smaller countries. Uh, so the idea that it was going to somehow uh, nibble on your sovereignty and be a long-term problem uh, wouldn't be there as much. And very importantly, the sense that it's a place of norms and values. Now, we don't always like those norms. We don't always like those values. Uh, but it does bring a certain uh, sense of standards uh, to the prevention of conflict. Now, uh, in addition to that, I think it's worth looking at the history uh, just very briefly. Um, one, I think much of what the UN was doing, particularly much of what secretaries general have done through good offices of mediation, fact-finding, all the other things through the years, really was about prevention. Uh, peacekeeping itself, in many ways, was to prevent either the recurrence or escalation of conflict. Uh, peace building uh, was very much to prevent uh, reoccurrence and recidivism in, in terms of conflict. Um, but uh, it was so endemic in what the organization did, it wasn't very well articulated uh, as a strategy. And that's where I think uh, uh, David and Cy Vance and the others in the Carnegie Corporation uh, project did a lot to sort of talk about structural uh, versus operational prevention and really putting it in a way that people could think about in, in a very straightforward way. And very importantly, with Kofi Annan as a Secretary General to carry your message, uh, had a very strong messenger uh, in that regard. So it wasn't that the UN had to find prevention. I mean, prevention was really, you know, in the DNA of the organization, but it needed a better way of thinking about that. And I, I think uh, David made a particular service uh, in, in that regard. Now, just before closing, uh, and I am going to be quick, uh, I wanted to say a word about uh, the prevention of genocide and about the responsibility to protect, uh, given that this seems to be my full-time avocation, uh, working on responsibility to protect uh, for the Secretary General. Uh, and working with uh, Francis Ding, the uh, Special Advisor for the Prevention of Genocide, and now working to form a, a joint office. But I might say something very briefly about that. It seems to me that the prevention of conflict and the prevention of atrocity crimes are not the same thing. And very often in the literature it's said that these things are very closely associated uh, with uh, armed conflict. That's sometimes true, but many cases, and we've seen this recently in Kyrgyzstan, uh, are not uh, related directly to armed conflict. So we can't simply take the tools and the methodologies that we've used uh, to try to prevent conflict and immediately say, therefore, uh, we're going to uh, prevent things like uh, atrocity crimes and, and R2P-type uh, crimes. Uh, second of all, uh, we have to look at the kinds of tools that we have in this area. Uh, we do have uh, in Francis's office uh, an early warning capability. It's fairly rudimentary. Uh, in, some, in some ways, but also it tries to draw together information from throughout the system. The UN doesn't lack information. It has a field presence in human rights, in humanitarian, in peacekeeping, in political affairs, uh, in the sense that it never did before. So it has a lot of hands-on information, and very often in the places where you would most want it. Uh, and there's about six or seven major streams of information from the field to headquarters, but in good UN tradition, of course, they don't talk to each other very much. Uh, so one of the things that we're trying to do is bring them all together uh, in this joint office so we actually can look at the patterns that are happening in some of these countries and see what the likelihood is of a rapid escalation of what in some cases are fairly chronic human rights violations into something much sharper and much more dangerous. But I think as we're going forward in this, we have to ask whether, in fact, have we made progress or not. Much of this, of course, was spurred by... Uh, uh, Rwanda, Srebrenica, the, the lessons of the, the, uh, the 1990s, uh, but are we doing better today? Uh, we're obviously focused a lot in recent weeks in Kyrgyzstan, and it doesn't look so very much better. Uh, but on the other hand, if you look at the kind of international engagement and you compare that with people doing their best to look the other way with Rwanda, there has been, I think, a significant 
a significant change. Uh, we've seen the OSCE, the High Commissioner for National Minorities, uh, and uh, Francis and myself trying to coordinate it a little bit on how we move forward. Uh, he's been using the term ethnic cleansing uh, to describe uh, what's happening, what has happened in Kyrgyzstan. In many ways, uh, this is the most classic situation uh, for responsibility to protect or ethnic cleansing that at least we've seen in the last several years that we've been, been working on this. Now, has the organization responded in quiet ways? I think it has diplomatically. I think the messages have gotten through to the parties, cease and desist, uh, that impunity isn't what it used to be. Uh, but on the other hand, can we move the Security Council? Can we move particularly one permanent member in the neighborhood uh, who's been a little cautious on international uh, involvement? There sort of remains to be seen. But I must say, in the informal kinds of discussions on these issues now, we don't see the kind of resistance uh, to seeing this in sort of R2P terms and seeing this in mass atrocity terms that one might have at another era and another time. So it was said early this morning that at the end of the day, I think Dick Solomon said that, you know, it's a question of political will. Uh, but the question is how do you shape that will and how do you make it uh, move in particular situations like this? And that's where I think, I think political concepts like R2P can be quite important to that. And the constant, a uh, little like the, the water against the rock, trying to get the Security Council to change its perspectives, uh, I think that rock is changing its shape a little bit. But it is still a rock, and we're still little, rather small drips trying to uh, trying to influence it over time. Uh, but I think if you look not only at Kyrgyzstan, but you look at Kenya, uh, which is the first case where we try to apply R2P and to uh, to discourage any more escalation, what appear to be ethnic cleansing uh, going on there. You look at Guinea. Uh, there have been some cases, some sort of quiet successes. But I think in every one of those cases, you'll see the UN be a piece of the puzzle but certainly not the whole puzzle. Uh, all of this is done with partners, regional, sub-regional, bilateral. And so I think the real question is, can you get many parts of the international community moving in the same direction uh, in some of these crises, not only to prevent conflict, but very importantly, not to uh, allow the kinds of crimes against humanity uh, that we're seeing, unfortunately, in, in too many places. Uh, I don't know, it's a little too early to, to write an assessment, uh, but it does seem to me that the old saying that uh, success has many fathers and a failure as an orphan uh, applies to the UN's work uh, in these areas. Uh, the failures are very conspicuous, the successes are very quiet, and again involve many partners and many fathers. So uh, I'll leave it to other scholars here to write the history of this, uh, but at the moment at least we're trying to forge ahead in a somewhat different way to uh, hopefully reshape that rock in, in bits and pieces. So thanks very much. Thank you, Dr. Luck. We will turn to Ambassador Herbst, and I would just have folks mark down the uh, vocabulary challenge that you've laid out um, about prevention as a catch-all for genocide prevention, for conflict prevention, and whether or not we have made it too big. Thank you. Um, I'd like to follow on the initial insight from Dr. Luck and apply it to the U.S. government. Um, by and large, you might say the State Department and USAID and other parts of the U.S. government looking overseas have had conflict prevention as one of their core responsibilities. But there's no question that we have decided to take this to a very different level. All the political element has always been part of the State Department function. But over the past several years, my office, the Office of the Coordinator for Reconstruction and Stabilization, has begun to look at the operational or, you might say, um, field view vision of what's necessary to prevent conflict. And we've come up with, um, in, in partnership with many others, including our friends at USAID, some tools which can be used for this. For example, we've created something called the Interagency Conflict Assessment Framework, something building upon AID's Conflict Assessment Framework to look at the drivers of conflict. And we have gone to over a dozen countries and applied this tool and helped our embassies reassess the types of uh, programs it runs in order to prevent conflict from breaking out. Um, we did one such program in, in Liberia, and we presented the, the findings of that program to President Sir Lee Johnson, who was delighted, and asked that we share it to a presentation for a cabinet. We've done it in places from Ecuador to Bangladesh to Southeast Asia. 
and by and large the results have been very, very positive. Uh, we have an office in SCRS called the Office of Conflict Prevention. They, they in fact, oversee this ICAF, and they work with their sister office in USIAD, the Office of Conflict Management and Mitigation. Uh, another tool we've used is to actually develop projects designed to prevent conflict. Uh, of course, our office has not had its own funds for doing this. We had to get a loan from the Defense Department. You've all heard of, I think, the 1207 program. And many of these programs have been designed um, in order to prevent conflict. Just to give, I mean, we actually have done in over 30 countries now, something like $330 million worth of projects. To give you one example, one of the early ones, we, we did something called the Haitian Stabilization Initiative. And in fact, underscoring the fact that what we're building in SCRS is an interagency capacity, that program was largely designed by our friends at USAID. And this program put helped put police back in Cité du Soleil, the principal slum in Port-au-Prince. We did that by training the police, by establishing a police headquarters, and also equipping them. We also developed, in connection with that, some community building and work um, creation programs. Uh, early warning is an important part of conflict prevention. One of the good things that my predecessor, one of the many good things my predecessor, Carlos Pasquale, did in SCRS, was to ask the agency to, put, to create an early warning list of countries that may come into crisis. And so one was produced um, five plus years ago. And that list comes out every six months, laying out the countries where there are serious problems and which may fall into instability. And of course, there are, con there are equivalents of that that are publicly available, foreign policies, if in Berlin, provide such tools. Uh, I want to keep this short, but I'll just mention two more things. Uh, one of a general variety, which is the capacity we're building is a capacity meant to work with many others. We created the Civilian Response Corps. As of last Friday, we had 1,042 people. Um, we're deploying them all over the world. We have 40 people on the ground in Afghanistan. That's not so much conflict prevention, but we have an operation right now in Sudan and in Kyrgyzstan, which both could fall into the category of conflict prevention. Uh, in Sudan, it's a question of what's happening with the referendum um, in coming up next January in the South, which the South has the right to vote on independence. There's no question there'll be substantial changes in Sudan. Uh, there's no doubt those changes could be messy. There are at least two sets of category-wide problems related to that. One are north-south issues, which could lead to out-and-out -out conflict. The other are problems relating to governance in the South, as whatever the result of the referendum, there will be a need for greater governing capacity in the South. Uh, our office has put, as of this state, nine people on the ground, but mainly in Juba, but also in Khartoum, to, one, beef up our missions to deal with the numerous problems that are coming down the road, and two, to assess those two sets of problems, those that involve north-south tensions, and those that involve governance in the South, so we can help um, mitigate those problems. We'll have another eight on the ground by this time next month, excuse me, by the end of this month. And based upon their assessments, we'll be putting perhaps another dozen or two people out in the field to hopefully lead to a transition which will not be a violent one. In Kyrgyzstan, we've put people out over the past about five or six weeks. Um, we were the State Department present in Osh when the um, violence broke out. Uh, unfortunately, the violence broke out and we couldn't stay, although we were there for the first few days and we help get other people out. We are also planning now to perhaps go back in once thing, actually things have calmed down some, and, and if, when the State Department goes back in, it will be our folks who are there to do that. Uh, when we go out, whether it's in Kyrgyzstan or Sudan, we have a substantial planning capacity, a capacity which will to enable us to not only ensure coordination across the U.S. government, a principal failing of our operations in the past in Iraq and Afghanistan, but also to ensure maximum coordination with international actors, both uh, governments and also NGOs. Certainly, when we go into any of these places, um, we need to be sure what others are doing, and we need to be sure that what we do is value-added and not operating at cross-purposes or in duplication with others. And actually, just to, to finish, um, in Sudan, the UN is planning a major um, operation on the ground to keep things calm. They want to have um, three or four people out, not just in every state capital in the south, but also in the county capitals. 
and we are talking to them about how we could put people out beyond Juba, which would be value added. Thank you very much. Heather, um, and we would we'll come back to the question of resources and how um, economically one sustains presence on the ground and whether you can go in and out or whether you need that permanence. Heather. Tara, thank you so much. Uh, thank you for this kind invitation to be with you this afternoon. It is technically impossible to talk about the EU in five minutes or less, <laughs> just with that caveat. I'm uh, uh, delighted to give a very brief overview of why I think the EU is, in fact, a very powerful actor to prevent conflict. And as the director of, of, of the, uh, Europe, the Europe program at CSIS, I don't often – describe the European Union as a powerful actor. Um, I think it's sometimes a challenged actor. Uh, but I think in this case, it deserves a lot of credit. So I'm going to describe some of the tools that the European Union has used, I think, very effectively. And then I'd like to just very, touch very briefly on three examples where, again, I think the EU has made a significant contribution, uh, certainly, to conflict prevention. I think the EU is so powerful because it's the largest provider of humanitarian and development assistance. I could stop right there and probably sit down. But it is a huge, it has important significance in its drive and development assistance. I think an interesting question that we'll have to look at in the long term is what the European economic crisis may alter that. But at this point, uh, it is a very significant uh, driver of development assistance. The European Union has presence on four continents. Out of, uh, in total, it has uh, led 24 civilian and military missions. Right now, nine are currently active. I think the policies of the European Union itself have promoted uh, conflict prevention, its enlargement process, its integration process, particularly in the Western Balkans. And then I think its partnership model, particularly in Africa, where it is promoting uh, uh, good governance, a, a strong focus on rule of law and good governance. So it's a powerful actor. I think a lot of the credit needs to be given to Chris Patton, who was then External Relations Commissioner for the European Union, who really focused and, and made sure that the, that the EU and everything it did, from its funding mechanisms to its structural work, made sure that conflict prevention was embedded uh, in all of the EU's policies uh, and certainly its development work. And it's developed, again, you'll, you'll hear similar to what Ambassador Herbst uh, was saying, the EU has developed an early warning unit. It has created a watch list. It has developed what they call intelligence fusion centers, which brings in the data that's needed to, to start working on we, are we heading towards potential conflict. It has created a checklist for root causes of conflict. And I'm going to very briefly just touch on the areas that this checklist looks at, legitimacy of the state, rule of law, respect for fundamental rights, civil society and media, relations between communities. Are there already embedded conflict resolution mechanisms, sound economic management, social and regional inequalities, and then the larger geopolitical situation? The European Union has developed a, a, a larger European development fund of which it's developed a governance initiative. And I'm going to focus a lot on governance and rule of law because that's where the EU tends to spend a great deal of its money and its capacity in developing uh, better and improved governance mechanisms. In 2007, the EU launched a program called the Instrument for Stability. It's a fund, it's a long-term fund that uh, supports crisis response projects around the world focusing on mediation, confidence building, uh, interim administration, rule of law, transitional justice. And it's recently been working on the role of natural resources as a driver of conflict. Uh, two other initiatives, it's created a peace-building partnership program, which is, again, part of this larger instrument for stability. But it looks at how to strengthen civilian expertise in peace-building and looking at ways to enhance the dialogue between EU institutions and civil society. All of these programs have, have actually culminated, and last year the EU developed this larger effort uh, known as the EU Implementation Plan. They've been doing this in pilot countries, uh, Burundi, uh, Haiti, Yemen, Sierra Leone. 
they're trying to build an, an, an integrated effort, what the EU terms the comprehensive approach, uh, and looking at all its programmatic activities in three areas, political cohesiveness. Now, in the EU with 27 members, I assure you political unity and speaking with one voice is perhaps the trickiest uh, of EU efforts, uh, but they're trying to develop that policy unity within the EU to attack uh, the, the, the implementation plan. Coherence what in our terminology we call the three Ds. Again, it's trying to bring in the security, the development, and the diplomacy all together. And finally, aid effectiveness. And Ambassador Herbst was saying that on-the-ground field coordination that is so challenging. The EU also focuses on, the, again, the, those root causes of conflict. They see poverty reduction as the key goal of conflict prevention with a, with a great focus on governance and rule of law. But they don't stop there. They look at trade policy. They look at social and environmental policies, the diplomatic, the political dialogue, and then the cooperation with other international actors. Again, it's a very much focused on a holistic approach. In 2003, the Europeans created their own security strategy, not dissimilar from uh, as we developed the national security strategy. And they developed five, they, they determined their five major threats. And within these threat columns, their three priorities were conflict prevention, rapid response, and assistance. So again, everything is infused with conflict uh, prevention. Three examples, and I'll, I'll close with this, where I think the EU has been particularly effective in, in three very different ways. Um, the EU's uh, law, uh, rule of law mission in Kosovo, the EU border assistance mission uh, to Moldova and Ukraine, and finally, it, the, it's been completed, the EU force in Chad and the Central African Republic. Let me just briefly explain. I, very fortuitously this morning, we had the uh, head of the EU uh, rule of law mission at CSIS, uh, who's phenomenal and gave a wonderful picture of uh, the work that the EU is doing uh, on police, judiciary, customs reform. Uh, it's the largest civilian uh, EU mission uh, under their common foreign and security policy. They're focusing on organized crime and corruption, again, that strong rule of law effort. It's making a huge difference. It's a technical advisory. It's not a political body. Getting back to that political unity question, five EU member states have not recognized Kosovo. That makes uh, EU policy towards Kosovo very challenging, but they have found a workaround to main you know, maintain technical assistance and advisory, and that's been an extremely effective program, working very collaboratively with K4 on the ground with the NATO operation, yet NATO and the EU technically are unable to work together right now, and that's a later discussion we can talk about it, uh, after questions. Secondly, that uh, it's called UBAM. It's the EU border assistance mission on the border between Moldova and Ukraine. About 200 people, so very, very small mission. Uh, it's helping Moldova and Ukraine customs officials uh, prevent and detect smuggling, trafficking in persons and goods. But I think its most important uh, mission, if, as you, if you were, uh, is an assessment of the security situation along the border, its risk analysis, its stronger interagency coordination among local actors. It's a tripwire, <coughs> and it's a preventative mechanism that's been on the ground since 2005. And finally, that EU force in Chad, this was the most multinational EU operation in, in Africa thus far. It included about 3,700 troops, uh, and it was basically the bridging operation until the UN mission could take over, protected civilians, refugees, IDPs, did some demining, provided, facilitated uh, the delivery of humanitarian assistant, assistance, and it was a nice bridging for when the UN mission, of which many EU member states remained in tr and transitioned to the UN force. But right behind that mission, under the uh, European Development Fund, the EU provided 311 million euros to support good governance and sustainable development in Chad. It's a nice complementary uh, rolling effort. Are there challenges to this? You bet. And as I said, trying to develop unity of purpose amongst 27 member states is always a trick added to the fact that uh, after uh, implementation of the Lisbon Treaty, uh, the EU has uh, created a new institution, the European External Action Service, and if you close your eyes, what this is trying to do is combine DOD, USAID, and the State Department, all rolled into one, working with 27 different foreign ministries to create a one single source for a comprehensive approach. Uh, it's a great experiment to watch, and we should all be watching very, very closely. 
You know, the EU is not a global player, but it does have a global impact, particularly in the development assistance. But I think its strongest mandate, it's a regional power, and that's in the Western Balkans and the Eastern Partnership countries of the, the Caucasus, uh, Moldova, Ukraine, and Belarus, with their integration policies. Slowly and surely, they're developing greater capacity in those regions. And I think that, for one, is a, an important contribution to stability in Europe. Thank you. As Lawrence makes his way up, we will um, just jot down for those who want to come back to the comprehensive word, the whole of government concepts and whole of whole world concepts, and how we're going to get all those actors on the same page. Lawrence. Thanks, Tara. Um, I'm happy to have an opportunity to talk a little bit about the conflict prevention efforts of ECOWAS, the Economic Community of West African States. We were looking forward to welcoming the director for political affairs from ECOWAS, uh, but he was called to lead their election monitoring mission in Guinea. So really conflict prevention in practice there. Um, but we felt that ECOWAS is an interesting enough case of uh, a sub-regional intergovernmental organization working on conflict pre prevention that we wanted to highlight the, their efforts. The first question is why is an economic community uh, working on conflict prevention? Um, ECOWAS was founded in 1975 to promote economic integration among the 15 uh, member states of West Africa. But uh, through that, the period since then, West Africa has witnessed uh, many uh, devastating violent conflicts, um, particularly um, the, the civil wars in, in Liberia and Sierra Leone, multiple conflicts in Nigeria, uh, and numerous other lower-level conflicts. And there has been an increasing recognition that violent conflict has prevented ECOWAS and its members from achieving the core economic integration goals set out in its charter. What we then had in 1990 was really kind of innovation under fire with the creation of ECOMOG, the uh, ECOWAS uh, ceasefire monitoring group uh, for Liberia. Uh, and then in the, in the period since then, in the 20 years since, um, we've seen a, a sort of move to formalize uh, and, and fill out the, the peace and security mechanisms uh, within ECOWAS. So let me highlight the progress. And I'd say that we've seen really very impressive progress at the level of uh, norms and institution building. Um, come back to the question of whether or the extent to which those have actually been put into practice consistently. In 1999, uh, ECOWAS members adopted uh, what they call by shorthand the mechanism, um, but it's officially the protocol relating to the mechanism for conflict prevention, management, resolution, peacekeeping, and security. So first thing to note is that conflict prevention is in the, uh, is in the name of this uh, mechanism, which really sets up the peace and security architecture. In essence, it, it parallels chapters 6, 7, and 8 of the UN Charter. Um, so the first thing that the mechanism does is create the institutions and supporting organs uh, within ECOWAS, including a, a mediation and security council, uh, a council of elders, uh, a commissioner, or what would become the commissioner for political affairs, peace, and security, uh, and an early warning system. Uh, which they explicitly say is for the purposes of conflict prevention. It also, th this document, uh, enabled ECOWAS to take certain kinds of conflict prevention uh, actions um, on the initiative of member states, of the Mediation and Security Council, uh, or even of the commission, uh, the, pre the president of the commission itself, which is really the secretariat. So things like fact-finding missions, mediation, facilitation, negotiation with parties, uh, are, are given to the, the authority of these various components of ECOWAS. A couple of years later, in 2001, there's a new protocol adopted, the Protocol on Democracy and Good Governance. And this really strengthens the normative foundations, particularly fo focusing on the need to uh, prevent internal crises that often emerged from uh, crises relating to, to governance and democracy or extra-constitutional changes in governments. So um, what you see is things like a, a, a rule that no ECOWAS member state can 
uh, change the electoral laws six months in advance of an election. And uh, ECOWAS, the commission, uh, has the authority to, uh, to dispatch observer missions for elections before, through, and after the electoral period. Now note this is giving the commission of ECOWAS this authority. It's not declared to be with the consent of the member state. This is actually quite a progressive uh, provision. A few years later, back in 2009, we have uh, adoption of the ECOWAS conflict prevention framework, which was several years in germination. And uh, to my eyes, it's really perhaps the, the best existing intergovernmental framework on conflict prevention uh, as such. Uh, first, it draws on much of the scholarship that has uh, emerged in the last uh, 20 or so years on conflict prevention. For example, it, it distinguishes between <coughs> structural prevention, the so-called sort of root cause or earlier prevention, and operational prevention, um, responding to crises or emerging crises. It discusses the, the differences between underlying structural risk factors, what you might call accelerators, and then triggers, and the way ECOWAS can understand its relationship with each of these. And, in, in, in fact, it invokes the responsibility to protect, um, which um, actually in the version that came out of the 2001 uh, Commission on Intervention on State Sovereignty. So th that's, I think, a, a certainly a strength of the, uh, the conflict prevention frame framework. It's also quite comprehensive. It has, uh, describes 14 components of ECOWAS action to prevent uh, violent conflict. And for each of those components, it then describes ECOWAS activities, uh, benchmarks, and uh, capacity needs. In, in certain respects, this reads to me like um, not all that different from what the QDDR process here in the, in the U.S. is aspiring to do, to match the goals, needs, and um, specific capacities. I would say there are grounds for a uh, critique, though. Um, this is an extremely ambitious document. Um, and you, you can, if you know the, the real capacities of ECOWAS and the, the limits of the capacities of its member states, uh, you can't help but observe that there's a bit of a mismatch between uh, the ambitions articulated in this framework uh, and the existing capacities of uh, the institution. Furthermore, I would suggest that 14 priorities is too many. Uh, and if you have a bit more of a skeptical reading, you might see that this reads a bit like a a shopping list for international donors. If the EU this year is interested in women in peace building, well, that's one of the 14 priorities. If it's interested in media, that's also one of the 14 priorities. Um, understandable for an institution like ECOWAS, which really survives on uh, donor support, but perhaps um, less than perfect for a strategy document. Then I think that if we look at, at where things stand today um, with ECOWAS in the West African region, the challenges for taking this very good framework uh, and set of norms and, and institutions that have been created, putting them into consistent practice to have a robust uh, conflict prevention mechanism, the, the challenges are still quite considerable. The first and, and maybe the foremost is that the political commitments in these documents uh, really are abstract and don't immediately translate themselves into action in specific cases. So whenever there is an emerging crisis in the region or there are discernible signs of, of risks in a particular member state um, and the Commissioner for Peace and Security decides that there are actions that ECOWAS should be taking, it's still up to him to try and cajole, persuade, uh, and find uh, space within the politics that inevitably play. There's still quite a bit of deference to uh, political leaders in the member states uh, and for them managing their internal problems. If, uh, and I think we probably should say internal problems in quotes. Second really uh, challenge relates to capacity. And I think I would try and say it's not simply limited capacity, but it's that the effects of having limited capacity on an institution which is trying to respond to so many uh, demands. We find playing out over and over again this tension between the desire for institutionalization uh, and the needs to respond to immediate crises. 
And that's certainly, I think, a theme that we've talked about throughout the day that plays itself out at the UN, in the US government, and elsewhere. But I think it's particularly acute when you have an institution like ECOWAS, which is resource strapped to begin with. Uh, it tends to promote uh, a situation where you have a small number of highly capable, highly linked in individuals who are running from crisis to crisis responding. Um, but where are they, where is the ability to then fill in under them at that level below and build up that, that new cadre that we need uh, to find? And third challenge is really uh, not about ECOWAS per se, but just about the context they're working in. And I think we've, we've talked about uh, today, particularly was underscored in the Latin American discussion this morning, that there is an increase in complexity when we look at violence uh, and violent conflict uh, or, or um, you know, violence writ large in these, in these countries. And what we see is maybe a little bit less of the uh, kind of classic political violence of a rebel group trying to overthrow a government, but we see uh, more uh, of the nexus between criminal activities, criminal violence, uh, and the ways that threaten uh, weak regimes and governments. To give two quick examples, uh, Guinea-Bissau, a small country in West Africa. Um, some of uh, our colleagues in the room were involved in some NGO efforts to engage in conflict prevention there uh, in the past several years. And I think, from what I understand, with some considerable success. But at the same time, they were engaging the sort of political parties. Uh, Guinea-Bissau became one of the main um, drug transshipment areas. And the, the, the drug cartels became increasingly powerful and really more powerful in many ways than the state and threatened the underlying stability. We also see a, a place like Niger, where we had, uh, in the last year, the, the sitting president, Tanja, um, trying to manipulate the rules to extend his, uh, his rule. Um, and that led to a coup, and now we have a sort of fragile transition period trying to find its way towards a new constitution and democratic and civilian rule. Meanwhile, there's an extreme food crisis uh, that's being responded to. Um, we also have questions about potential Islamic radicalization. Uh, there are questions of whether uh, al-Qaeda and the Islamic Maghreb is operating in parts of Niger. Uh, and we, at the same time, still have sort of bubbling um, remnants of older rebel movements in the, the Tuareg rebellion. So I think what we see is a, a complexifying, if that's a word, of the, of the security environment in West Africa. And it's causing uh, extreme pressures and challenges on an institution like ECWAS, even as much as they've committed to, uh, to taking robust action to prevent conflict. Thanks. We will complete now with Peter our set of formal prepared remarks. And if people would begin to get their questions in order, we'll go after Peter directly to the floor. Thank you. And thank you, United States Institute for Peace, and especially Owen Williams for inviting me. Uh, I'm very happy. I'm the last speaker I realize in a long list, so I try to follow the orders of our facilitator. And not to bore you. Um, it's my job to talk you through the role of civil society organizations uh, in relation to conflict prevention. Why are civil society organizations important? First of all, they have information about realities on the ground. They have information about where conflict might brew. <coughs> They also might have some ideas about solutions to conflict situations. Civil society organizations provide inroads into local communities, and they are often present in situations where other actors have left, where even the government may have withdrawn in fragile states, in places like Somalia. If there is no government, there will still be civil society organizations. They build relationships between communities. They offer opportunities to help in mediation. In the academic literature, this comes with different language. Some call it social capital, building trust, credibility. 
it leads to a possible contribution to ownership of peace building processes, the ownership that we are all craving for. Um, civil society organizations have capacities to implement preventive action, have capacities to prevent, um, uh, to implement uh, uh, in very early phases and delicate phases of uh, rebuilding societies, concrete projects on the ground. Uh, we just heard some introduction on also how that can relate to economic development. So there's a huge potential in civil society to contribute to conflict prevention and peace building. Do we optimally make use of that potential? That, I think, is the question. What is the good news there? Well, I represent the Global Partnership for the Prevention of Armed Conflict, a worldwide network with more than a 1,000 members organized in 15 regional networks. So the good news I can bring you today is we have a network. <laughs> and that's not a small thing, I can tell you. Because networking in civil society on the issues of peace building and conflict prevention is a relative latecomer. I think it's an interesting observation to share with you this afternoon. Um, there are various reasons for that. The recognition of the role of civil society in issues of conflict and peace building has been more difficult compared to the recognition of the role of civil society in humanitarian assistance or in issues of social and economic development. After all, wasn't conflict and security the business of states and governments? And you know what did civil society want there at that negotiating table? It took longer time to get that recognized. And to the extent we have something like global governance in place, um, the issue of security, human security, has been separated from, for example, the series of UN conferences taking place in the 1980s and the 1990s on a number of... To the extent we have something like global governance in place, um, the issue of security, human security, has been separated from, for example, the series of UN conferences taking place in the 1980s and the 1990s on a number of global issues you probably remember. We had Rio de Janeiro on sustainable development, we had Vienna on human rights, and we had Copenhagen on social development. All opportunities for civil society organizations active in those fields to meet and to gel, so to say. So the collaboration between civil society organizations in those fields is older. Um, it led to the formulation of the multilateral development goals, the MDGs. They were mentioned earlier today. And as I'm sure you will know, uh, a goal on security, on human security, is conspicuously absent in the MDGs. So that is something that we may consider repairing a bit. Uh, in September there will be the 10-year the review conference in New York, but I think you know, if we want to progress global governance on these issues, we may want to revisit the MDGs. Another point that I'm not sure many of you have ever thought about is um, civil society organizations in this field are relatively small. Uh, the largest single organization that is, has a designated mandate to focus on peace building is International Alert, based in London. It has about 100 staff, and that's all. That is very small compared to Oxfam International, CARE, you know, Catholic Relief Services, World Vision, you name them, the large players. And so we're talking about qualitatively about the different field of civil society organizations. Um, Kofi Annan, in his report on the prevention of armed violence in 2002, basically asked civil society to get its act together on the field of conflict prevention. And so a series of regional conferences took place, 2002, 2003, 2004, leading to a global meeting in the UN headquarters uh, now almost exactly five years ago as we speak. Uh, and I think it's fair to say that in that conference, 
the Global Partnership, GPEC, was launched. What have we been doing in those five years? Apart from being active in a number of cases for, you know, I just don't have the time to go into the details right now, I think it's, again, fair to say we have been mainly building the network because that is work. Um, and that relates to issues referred to in various interventions earlier today. Complexity is the problem of our time. It's written all over the discussions today. And so what we are learning in our network is to act simultaneously and to act multidimensionally, from local to national to regional to international level. That is very difficult. It needs to be learned, and that's what we are learning in GPEC. So I'm happy to report that to you. It's what we are learning right now in Kyrgyzstan. Yeah, just last Thursday, I, have, I was involved in a phone conference where we had, some of you may know, our chair is Emmanuel Bombande from Buanep. He was on the phone 45 minutes with our regional initiator in Kyrgyzstan, who is all clearly in a difficult situation. I wish I could play the tape of the conversation for you here in this room. Because in such conversations, you, you can listen to what the added value of a global network is. Emmanuel bringing his experience, his thinking to Raya Kadarova, helping her in that situation to think through strategic questions, questions of how to deal with the media, how to move forward, how to respond to statements of ad luck, and so on. <laughs> <laughs> um, so that's, I guess, the good news. What are the challenges and what is the bad news? Well, political space is the problem. The political space for civil society organizations to make th uh, this potential contribution to articulate their voice, the political space is limited in many contexts and in some cases it is closing down. We operate in fragile states, we operate under repressive regimes that do not want to hear any critical voice, that do not want to listen to information that they don't like, they deny freedom of expression, freedom of association that may put people into jail and in a worst case may even kill them. Um, this is a serious problem and this is where the European Union, the US government can and must play a role I think to help protecting the space for civil society organizations. It's really important to do that. The problem is not limited to fragile or repressive states. The problem also plays out in northern countries, and in that regard, I have to return to a question asked this morning about a recent ruling of the U.S. Supreme Court, which in effect makes contact with listed terrorist organizations a criminal offense. This, my dear friends, is a bad ruling of the U.S. Supreme Court. It creates an untenable position in the field. It is not possible if you work in Gaza not to relate to Hamas. It's just not possible. Um, so, with all respect for the efforts to curb terrorism, which I don't think is something anybody reasonable will disagree with, but this is not the way to go. We have to talk to the bad guys sometimes. And this ruling needs to be reversed, or the interpretation, rather, of what is a terrorist organization probably can be repaired by the U.S. Congress, because I'm afraid that it will really hurt the U.S. image abroad. Finally, what are the main challenges and where are, where are opportunities that we are working on? I'm, I'm happy to echo a number of uh, the earlier speakers um, who have referred to the importance of the role of regional organizations. We very much believe in the role of regional organizations and we are very actively working on promoting the relationships between civil society and regional organizations. Why? Well, I can repeat the number of the arguments already made today. Regional organizations are closer to potential conflicts. They have no exit option. If you have a potential conflict in your region, you cannot walk away from it like the UN can if it wants to, or NATO, or my government running out of Afghanistan. Um, 
there there is greater legitimacy there is greater effort and i think we are we are encouraged by hopeful signs that to see organizations like the african union taking on a more active role and mm-hmm. thanks lawrence for i think an excellent explanation of what a sub regional organization like ecowas can do in setting best practices really interesting and important for all of us to look at so um we're looking at that we're working on that and um Yesterday, I was meeting with the uh, Assistant Secretary General of the OAS, Ambassador Ramdin, and I'm happy to report to you that GPEC and the Organization of American States will convene a meeting of regional organizations later this year precisely to discuss this issue. How can we further improve, bolster active interaction between civil society and regional organizations focused on conflict prevention and peace building? Thank you. Well, thank you to all of the panel members. They've given you many paths to wander down. The ever-present danger of a total flare-up between Hindus and Muslims. Uh, Remember that India, one country, has more people than all the 53 countries of Africa combined. Remember that Muslims make up 14% or approximately between 150 and 160 million in India. When the population was one quarter this size at the time of partition, there were between one million and two million people killed on both sides. So potentially, this is not a small problem. Ashutosh Varshini, who was at Michigan at the time he did his study, is now at Brown, looked at this, and he came to two surprising conclusions. One, that there's approximately 500 to 1,000 districts altogether in India. The problem is a serious problem that re- repeats itself in only 18, one eight, of these districts. Second surprising conclusion, in these districts, when you control for the different variables, the single factor that explains success in dampening and muting Hindu-Muslim uh, tensions as riot breaks out and preventing larger scale killings, the single biggest explanation for success is not government policy, but the presence and role of civil society actors. If there are pre-existing civil society where they are integrated, they run into action immediately and drop that. So that's a very important uh, example for the positive impact of civil society compared even to government. That's as a comment. The question is both to John Herbst and and Luck. You both talked about Kyrgyzstan uh, and the problems which I, I agree with. I'd be very interested in your assessment of the potential impact of the recent referendum uh, as we go forward. And as the panelists answer, if we can keep in mind the the goal of, of really establishing the initiatives that are going to work going forth, and um, Kyrgyzstan being a, a difficult one. But Ed Locke and then John Herbst. Uh, thank you, I guess, Ramesh. Um, <laughs> Ramesh, of course, is one of the, uh, the fathers of Responsibility Protect, had a very active and important role on the uh, ISIS uh, uh, commission. Um, I'm not an expert in Kyrgyzstan. Um, I would just say that um, I wouldn't assume that we've really crossed a threshold here and that all is fine. Um, Many people were watching Kyrgyzstan very carefully, uh, including at the UN, including in in, uh, Francis's office, uh, for quite some time. Uh, I don't think many people expected the kind of violence exactly when Mm -hmm. it occurred and how it occurred. And so, yes, there was early warning, there was watch, there was this and that, but we still, in some ways, were caught unprepared. And I think that's probably true today as well. And so... You know, having no expertise on the issue, I would just err on the side of caution uh, that things could fall apart. Um, you know, the referendum did some good things, hopefully, but it set up a political system which would probably be highly contested. And uh, one assumes that the violence was not random, that there were some political motivations as part of it, uh, and uh, there were elements that probably were uh, organized and incited, uh, which is why some of us think, you know, some kind of uh, either national or international inquiry over time might be helpful. Whether this is the right time for that, I don't know. Uh, it might be, be too disruptive. But I do, I do think that uh, 
Uh, there's a lot of tensions that people have seen there for decades, uh, but uh, I don't think they're all put to bed by one referendum. I'm in a bit of a difficult position in answering your question because our office is in Kyrgyzstan, you might say, as a con as a um, asset at the disposal of our, of our ambassador, Tatiana Gefelovolkov. And the person in your question is really more a political one. Now, I have some views on that because I spent some time in Central Asia, but it's really more appropriately addressed to Bob Blake, the Assistant Secretary for South Central Asian Affairs. I can safely say, though, that the referendum is, I think, a step forward, that it, it does enhance stability. But following up on what Ed said, the extent of that is by no means clear. The problems which led to the recent violence are by no means resolved. And um, this is an a area that needs um, more attention, and we'll be paying attention. Before we go to the next question, um, Ed Luck, I just wanted to follow up inquiries. Do they have any impact on this prevention arena? We, we have inquiries. They often come late, long after, and one is forced to wonder what value they do play in prevention. Well, it's very hard to know cause and effect in these things. Um, but I do think in most of these situations, uh, it's worth taking a long-term perspective. Um, and obviously, an inquiry isn't going to <coughs> quell immediate tensions and, and put everything behind one. But it does seem to me the narrative, the understanding of one's history, the understanding of what happens and why is very important in the long term. And uh, it may lead to reconciliation. It may lead to... Uh, some difficulties for some people, um, but uh, if there are very different views within society about uh, why things happened, how they happened, who did what to whom, uh, you know, I think it just makes it easier to point the fingers. And uh, in these kinds of situations, it's so often that historical uh, incidents, imagined or real, are cited, and one view very often is that, you know, we're being persecuted by others in our society, one group by another, and based often on, on myth and um, uh, things that are passed down uh, without any careful inquiry. So I think in the long term, this sort of thing can be helpful in a society um, and uh, should be encouraged. And at the very least, for those of us uh, in the international community, we need to have a better understanding of what happened and why. Uh, where we did well, where we did not do well, where we might have done better, uh, because it does seem to me we need to have a lot of accumulative uh, lessons uh, to be learned. And so this can be a piece of that of that puzzle. And it could be, one never knows, but it could be that kind of an international presence, that kind of a discourse uh, internally encouraged by international actors who are seen as impartial, uh, could be helpful in bringing some things to the surface and maybe disputing some of the rumors and some of the other things that tend to go around uh, in these kinds of situations. Over here, then here, and if a few of you would like to come around, we can go side by side. Thank you. Um, my, my name is Eli McCarthy. I'm a professor at Georgetown University. John, I have a question for you. I, really intrigued by the Civilian Response Corps. I think it's a pretty good idea. And I was looking at some of the, the experts that are, that are listed as a part of it. And I was wondering if you think it's um, wise and if you'd be willing to commit to adding two, two new types of experts. Um, the first type would be it's often called nonviolent conflict intervention or nonviolent struggle. Examples would be like Gene Sharp or Michael Nagler in academia. Some of the key practices would be like non-cooperation or unarmed peace peacekeeping, such as uh, the Nonviolent Peace Force is a good example of an organization doing that right now. So that would be the first type. And then the second type would be experts in religious affairs. Okay. Um, one, we are regularly reviewing the skills that we need. And in fact, that we did a review about a year and a half ago. There will be another review at the end of this year. Uh, I can't say we had considered these before. Uh, I can say we've been thinking beyond the technical skills we originally recruited for. For example, uh, I mean, well, the, the original concept was to bring in experts in various functional areas 
to help governments develop capacity in those areas. But the idea was always to match those skills with area expertise. So something that, that I've been telling my folks to look at is, let's bring in um, an, a professional anthropologist to that level of uh, analysis and also to help us reach out to the computer community of anthropologists so we can have access to real, I mean, deep area experts, people who know certain tribes and certain countries and, certain, and so on. Uh, your two suggestions uh, make sense, and we'll take a look at it. Uh, and the, what we will certainly do over time is have outreach to many of the various communities, including these, so we can pull in precisely the right person for precisely the, well, the conflict in question. Thank you. One thing to add on the religion, the Institute has been training, um, been working with state and other organizations to bring the religion and peace building dimensions into the overall toolkit, if you will, for foreign service officers. Peter, do any of these groups, either nonviolence or religion based, fit in this community or network that you were talking about? Definitely. Yeah, and um, uh, thanks for the command, uh, Ramesh. I appreciate it a lot, of course. And yes, what can I say? I mean, as we speak, Kyrgyzstan, the discussion is how to reconcile ethnic and religious issues. I mean, and that's what we're working on. So, yes. Coming over here. Uh, thanks so much for your time. Uh, Brian Stout with USA and the Africa Bureau, working on Somalia. Though my question is, what's my own? Um, I was a little surprised in the discussion of conflict prevention not to hear more about transitional justice, and in particular about legal international mechanisms for combating impunity. In my mind, at this point, is going specifically the Kenyan context. To what extent do you feel there is a role for the ICC, the ICTY, the ICTR, and those types of mechanisms as an essential component of, in my mind, with conflict prevention looking forward and trying to address some of the current or the issues that drove the conflict in the first place? I'm going to go to Lawrence because we wrestled with many of these issues in the Genocide Prevention Task Force, and so I will give you the hot potato. Sure, thanks. Um, I think it's a good question. I would say transitional justice, broadly conceived, is an important conflict prevention tool. Um, I have a, a fair bit of skepticism about the prevention potential of judicial mechanisms like the ICC or the ICTY, um, which by their by design are targeting the a small set of um, of leaders uh, or orchestrators of, of broader um, kinds of violence. Um, I mean, I think the, the literature on deterrence, on sort of systemic deterrence based on uh, justice mechanisms suggests that you need to have a, an expectation among potential perpetrators that they will be held accountable. And um, I don't think there's any kind of reasonable expectation that you, you could think a potential perpetrator in Kenya or anywhere else would have that they will be held accountable by the ICC, um, just given the number of people who are being uh, tried. So I think, but broader, the question of transitional justice to try and promote the reconciliation and, and move through uh, grappling with, with past injustices and, and extreme violence, I think, is very important. Heather, I just want to, um, since you deal with the political will issue of many European countries, whether where are we on a consensus view of transitional justice and its role in prevention? Well, actually, uh, I just came back yesterday. I was in Belfast for several days at the Transitional Justice Institute looking at uh, Northern Ireland. And your question to her on the inquiry, um, uh, you know, with the release of the Saville report uh, and the role that transitional justice has played in Northern Ireland actually has been a fascinating uh, example of in that particular inquiry, which was 12 years, I'm, I cannot, this is jet lag, I can't recall the exact uh, f uh, figure, but it was an extraordinary amount of money uh, to do that. But it had an enormous impact on both sides of the issue. Um, as many of my uh, colleagues said, you know, there is no one truth to be found in an inquiry, but there can be many truths that can be discovered. And the fact that this report was really accepted by both sides as being uh, an accepted truth, there was a huge role that that actually played. Now, the 12-year time horizon and the fact that it was uh, part of the uh, Good Friday Peace Agreement, it was a broader effort, but I, I've seen where 
inquiries do play a, a critical role. Transitional justice, I think, again, um, is something that the EU has been focusing on. I think, again, it, it's, it's been the challenge of implementation, and I see it infused and embedded in their, across the board in their rule of law process. Uh, and the capacity building to deal with it. But that is a very long-term effort, and I think sometimes it gets just overwhelmed by the press of other issues and the implementation of other programs. Ed, did you want to come in on this? If I could just comment on, on Lawrence's comment, uh, and I, I try to make uh, a practice of never disagreeing with Lawrence, but <laughs> on, on the question of uh, deterrence, um, I, I know the literature, and I, I know that's what people tend to conclude, but one has to recognize, one, that yes, it may be a rather few number of leaders who might be affected by this, but those are very often the people inciting the violence uh, and helping to organize the violence. And uh, so I think that's not insignificant. Um, second of all, you know, you have to think about what tools uh, do international diplomats and others have to play with in these kinds of situations. It's not a huge list. Um, and so we hate to throw out, you know, one saying they're not very effective because you probably don't have really effective ones to call on, so you're choosing against among a series of rather ineffective choices. And, and it does seem that in Kenya, I mean, both Kofi Annan and, and Ban Ki-moon, Secretary General, when he was there, they both used the, the ICC, the, uh, the question <coughs> impunities and what it used to be themes, and it seemed to have some effect uh, on both sides. Uh, you know, you need not only uh, national leaders, but uh, if there are armed groups or opposition groups as well. So it's uh, very anecdotal, but it does seem to me that it's suggestive that uh, it may not be a bad thing uh, because uh, you can't, you know, promise that the Security Council is, is going to do anything. You can't promise more forceful measures. You may or may not be able to, to say something about sanctions. Uh, in the case of Kenya, I think there were real uh, EU and the U.S. put real economic pressure on. But on top of all that, you are dealing with individuals, and to bring it home to them, uh, they can, uh, uh, you know, get around sanctions. They, they can do other things, but uh, uh, that they personally could be held accountable, I think, can weigh on people's minds, and, and certainly not not something to uh, to throw away just because it's not super effective. Because you have to see the choices. There aren't super effective choices, so you, you choose among the lesser lot. Now, quickly stay here, and then come to these two questions, and then we will come back over here. Yeah, uh, David Grant from Nonviolent Peace Force. And I have a question about uh, Israel and, and uh, Palestine, since that was uh, highlighted this morning. Um, we've, I've spoken with the Arab uh, Partnership for the Prevention of Armed Conflict, which is a member of GPAC, uh, one of your regional organizations, as well as, uh, of course, several organizations inside Israel. And uh, as a nonpartisan organization, we just can't find a way to deal with that. And I wonder... <laughs> in the network, have you struggled with that to, to get an opening there for a, I should say also that in the, uh, Mindanao in the Philippines, we have now a, a formal official role at, as part of the international monitoring team between the Moral Islamic Liberation Fund and the government of the Philippines. And I wonder if, if this, if you see this as a wave of potentially uh, where civil society can play a role that the UN, for instance, cannot been dealing with it, especially in Israel and Palestine. Peter. Um, that's a good question. Um, and we're dealing with it as we speak because we plan to come, you know, with our international steering group meeting to Beirut uh, later this year. Um, it is difficult to deal with, amongst others, because uh, civil society organizations in a number of Arab countries are... Uh, under law in Lebanon, for example, that if they are seen to be active in any form or shape in, or in a formal sense uh, with Israeli NGOs, uh, they are liable. Uh, so that is a problem that uh, I'm not able to resolve out of the Hague, unfortunately. Um, so what we do is we arrange uh, opportunities to meet uh, for civil society representatives from the different sides in other settings, in an informal way. Um, and that is happening uh, frequently. 
and we are benefiting from some participants. We have a few uh, uh, organizations that historically were able to register as an Israeli organization and, and as a Palestinian organization, including, I'm sure, some of the people that you know and work with. Uh, so they also help to build those bridges. So we are able to maintain a thin line of communication between the different groups uh, on the different sides of the fence, so to say, and to keep communications going. Over here. Thank you very much. Uh, Dennis Sandoli from the Institute for Conflict Analysis and Resolution at George Mason University. I was wondering how each of you in your respective domains sees reconciliation being fostered between the warring factions. Reconciliation, like transitional justice, seems to be an endangered species. Thank you very much. Uh, which one of you would like to make the case for or against more activity on the reconciliation front? Uh, I'll make a, just a quick comment. Um, I think, you know, we've talked uh, throughout the day about the often cyclical nature of conflict. Uh, and so in light of that, I think reconciliation efforts are, are critically important. And if we take the long view, as, as I think Ed was suggesting, um, reconciliation among communities is has got to be an important piece of a broader set of tools for conflict prevention. Um, and, you know, when we think of conflict prevention, we should remind ourselves we're not talking about necessarily preventing disputes uh, in the first, but, but preventing disputes from escalating into violence. And so there are lots of going to be intergroup disputes in every society, and that's often quite healthy. Um, but what we need to do is try and help and facilitate, um, you know, reconciling to, to past injustices or violence so that current disputes and differences can be managed peacefully. Yes, follow on. Thanks. Bridget Moix with the Friends Committee on National Legislation. Uh, thank you all very much um, for the work that you're doing and for sharing it with us. I want to um, return to one of the themes that Ambassador Yates started with, which is the um, resource imbalance, um, because this seems like a particularly important panel to, um, to address this question. And uh, I'm partly, um, well, you know, one of the values of prevention is that it should be much less expensive, require fewer people, so you don't have to invest huge amounts in it. But um, the gap still between the massive amounts of funding that goes to reacting afterwards um, through military intervention or whatnot compared to civilian capacities. I didn't want to ask what all your budgets are that you're working with, but I know they're very minimal. Um, and for instance, in the, in the U.S., we have a great opportunity in the sense that you have people like Secretary of Defense Gates making the case for civilian capacities to help prevent and mitigate, but we still have a Congress that keeps underfunding these, these programs. So just last night, the House Appropriations Subcommittee cut funding for things like the Civilian Response Corps and the Complex Crises Fund, um, and there will be more war spending passed tonight. So I'm just trying to figure out how do we grapple with this, this problem that we still seem to have won an argument that people recognize the importance of these tools, but we haven't won the budget, you know, yet. And, and how do we get beyond that? I don't know why, but I feel drawn to go to Ambassador Herps first <laughs> on this question. Oh, I, I agree with you, Bridget, that, that we've kind of won the argument. Say kind of, to the extent that people have paid attention, we won the argument. But we haven't truly won it, or you might say the victory of the of the logic has not been institutionalized. And I think the only way to actually do that um, may be a bridge too far. Uh, that is to establish a, a national security budget, which includes the State Department, includes USAID, and includes parts of, of other budgets which have a national security impact. Um, this may be purely a, manage, a, ma a matter of packaging because national security gets sort of a, uh, an immediate I.I. in ways that other parts of the budget do not. But it has the virtue of making sense. There, there, there's, there's no doubt that if, as a result of smart prevention programs by the State Department and or USAID, uh, we prevent a situation in a country where we have not real interest at stake from spiraling out of control, A, we protect our security, and B, we do it on the cheap. 
but um, our culture has, has come to accept the notion that guys in uniforms are doing national security, and whereas others, even if they are in fact doing national security, are not necessarily doing that. On the UN front, how do you handle this balancing? You have obviously people in uniform and not, and so um, your balance of the pie for prevention. Yeah, I, I'm probably the wrong person to ask about resources because in Responsibility Protect, we have none, <laughs> period. We don't have a penny uh, that's been uh, uh, given so far in this area, uh, which may be why we're doing fairly well, at least in the theory <laughs> part of it. Practice might be a little more expensive. Um, but um, I, I, uh, I think that, that would change now. We were, up to this point, we didn't want to take any voluntary contributions from countries because it would be from the north, and we didn't want to feed into this idea that this is a northern idea and um, make the north-south piece any worse. Um, so literally, we haven't had a penny because the assembly has yet to, to vote any money in this area. Uh, e even my travel has to be covered by hosts or by others or, you know, foundations or whatever, uh, or, or by the International Peace Institute. So, and I have no staff either, no, no staff on, on R2P at this point, um, and a full-time job on the outside. So it makes life a little bit complicated. But um, and Francis Sting's side, uh, you know, which is more established, uh, it's still pretty modest. Uh, he has, I think, five people on regular budget um, um, and uh, four uh, extra budgetary, very short term. Uh, we're now trying to convert the extra budgetary posts into budgetary, uh, and add all of two people on, on our 2P. Uh, but we're trying to create in one office. Everyone works uh, on, on everything. Um, but for the early warning, for the assessment, for the advocacy, uh, for the political work, you don't need a lot of people and you don't need a lot of money. Um, and I think sometimes, I, you know, this is probably heretical to say here, uh, sometimes I think a lot of people, a lot of money gets in the way because you focus too much on the bureaucratic issues and, and uh, the other things. And um, uh, the message gets a little confused and so much conversation, so much coordination, this, that, and the other thing. Now, obviously, um, uh, most people at the UN would not agree with that. They look at the same thing and they say, you know, uh, peacekeeping is now getting to $8 billion a year. And if you look at the Department of Political Affairs or peace building or, or God forbid, genocide prevention, they're tiny, tiny in comparison. But I, I don't think that's really important. It's, it's not the question of how much money is spent on the other things. The question is whether you have enough resources in your area to do what needs to be done. And I think that for the UN, uh, which never has much money other than in peacekeeping, uh, to do much of anything, and that, of course, is very small compared to what governments uh, spend. And UN peacekeeping is much cheaper than when, when certain governments, I won't mention them, uh, do, do the same things. Uh, they're much more expensive. Uh, or if, if NATO or EU or others do, it's much more expensive than when the UN does it. Um, but I don't think, you know, trying to do everything in cheap is necessarily the way to go. But uh, there is a multiplier effect, and I think the question of the, the values, the politics, the standards, uh, really in the end are, are very important. And, uh, you, you know, you can throw lots and lots of money and people at a bad policy, and you still have a bad policy uh, at the end of the day. Uh, so, um, you know, I guess at the UN you sort of get used to thinking about why doing things on the cheap is not always such a terrible thing. Uh, but you have to have a certain minimum uh, to, to get by. But, you know, UN standards are nothing compared to, uh, to governments or the EU or whatever, you know. The, the UN is very, very thin. Um, it's very, very broad, very, very ambitious. But in any particular area, it tends to be rather thin. And now in, in the field, I mean, vacancies rates of 40, 50, 60, 70 percent are not unusual, partly because of the terrible personnel system and the human resources system. I see uh, uh, Abby has some familiarity with that. Uh, you know, it's, it's just very hard to, to bring people in and very hard to move people around and very hard to replace people who aren't doing a good job. Uh, so that, that makes, it, makes it a bit worse. But, um, you know, I think for the UN, it's, it's what it is. Uh, and that's what matters most. And if that's helpful to have that kind of a presence, that kind of universality, uh, in a particular situation, uh, it's not first and foremost how many people you have there. Uh, but I think obviously for organizations that are more heavily operational, uh, because I think a lot of the, what the UN does is political and symbolic, um, it obviously matters, it matters a good deal more. Peter, and then we'll take two questions in a row and have everybody answer them so that we, um, we don't lose the opportunity. Peter. 
I'd just like to comment on Bridget's question. Um, number one, conflict prevention has always been a story hard to sell to donors, right? Uh, how do you prove that something didn't happen? That's the classic question. Um, so I think it's important that we continue to bring out the stories of success, like the Kenya, the Guinea, or you know, Ramesh example just now. I think we have to continue to do that. A second observation is that we live in a time where practically every government has to cut drastically uh, in, in budgets. Um, in my observation, in any case in Europe, uh, the extent to which this field survives is not bad. I mean, if you look at the recent cuts in the UK, for example, DFID survives, and you know it's revising its conflict prevention program, and there will still be funds, which is you know so it's a relative thing. But so in a regressing market, we're holding out not so bad. So that's you know put the some light. Third is, I think we do have a job to do in educating. Um, let's say the new philanthropy, the, the, the people who start to build foundations, uh, you know, who, who made their money in IT or whatever, and who start with more charitable sort of objectives, and where we have to start educating them on this more complex story, because I think it's important for us in the long term to, to reach out to them. Heather, on the European parliaments, if we sat in and listened to their debates, is would we discern a chord uh, similar to what we would find in our congressional debates over these national security issues, or is there a different spin on it? Um, well, it's, it's funny because Europe is being very public about its austerity. Uh, we're doing it, uh, Congress is doing it quietly by not extending long-term unemployment benefits and, you know, maintaining us on a continuing resolution. It's doing it by other means because... Uh, debt reduction is becoming a, a, a political imperative, whether as in Greece that you are, have no option but to do it, and in Germany you're sort of doing it preemptively uh, to show leadership to other European countries that may not be uh, showing this leadership. Uh, but it's also uh, sticking specifically to, to Germany. I believe it's, it's, it's a, a frame of reference of how Germany would like to see EU evolve economically over time. But I think, in picking up on Peter's comment, I agree with you. The austerity measures thus far, as we understand them, and I think this is going to be a continuing story, has protected, in the UK's perspective, uh, ODA and defense spending. But I think what this gets to, and it links to what uh, Ambassador Herbst was saying, it's the political will that is being chiseled away at here. We're seeing, particularly European leaders, um, that are being led very much by public opinion. The leaders aren't leading public opinion. Um, they are growing less adventuresome. They are focusing on the domestic policies. And this is eroding political will. I mean, we have the information. We know when the crisis emerges, but so often the political will is lacking. And that's what, you know, I think uh, this economic crisis long term may weaken political resolve to tackle uh, conflicts, and I think, again, Afghanistan, for the European perspective, again, where public opinion comes in, has a tremendous impact on future uh, types of, of, of activities. Again, it will be interesting, uh, picking up on the national security budget perspective, if we start thinking of these not in silos, but as a continuum where constantly diplomacy and development is continually working together and evolving, and, you know, when failure happens, then you go into the security realm. If we start thinking like that, we might be able to see where this, this, this holistic approach really has an impact. But until we get out of the silos, and as I said, Europe's a great exper experiment, I think, in trying to break down those silos. It will be years until we see if it has any impact. Maybe that's how you get out of the cycle a little bit. Let's take two on this side and answers, and then two more and some closing thoughts. Well, this is ancient history by now. You've taken quite a while to get over to this side. Um, I agree with Lawrence Wucher, uh in taking an agnostic position. Juan Mendez, who headed the International Center for Transitional Justice, coined that phrase for me, agnostic with respect to the preventive functions. Now, whether the ICC and similar courts are justified is no question in my mind. I fought alongside Michael Posner and many others in this country, President Carter, to try to get us to support the ICC. There are very good reasons for doing that. But if you ask, does it serve a preventive function, 
I think it's extremely difficult to know, but there is a piece of empirical data that's quite interesting. Priscilla Hayner, who was one of the founders of the International Center for Transitional Justice, unfortunately has just left it, um, did a very good book covering about well, all the I see all the uh, transitional courts that then existed. I think this is 31, and uh, there's a new edition coming out. And she finds that if the trials or whatever you call them are on radio and television, it has a very powerful effect. Huge audiences, far beyond what anybody expected. And uh, so her inclination is that if you want to have a preventive function or hope to, that that is the best possible way. Now, we don't really know, at least she doesn't, what the reactions were exactly, but she, the level of interest suggests that people may come away with something important about uh, injustice. I also would like to express the view that ICTJ is not dead, not dead at all. We just hired a new president for ICTJ, a very able person, got some new money for it. Despite the recession, uh, the International Center for Transitional Justice is still alive. That's only one part of the field, of course. But let's not give up on it. I think that there's uh, plenty of room for growth in that field yet and a great need for it. Thank you. Staying right on this side. <laughs> Hi, I'm Kathy Gokul with National Defense University. And of course, I would be the one that would bring up what about the role of security in prevention? And particularly as we look at things moving to more of a regional focus, um, the capabilities don't really appear to be there. And also the U.S. is very involved in all of the regional, uh, I'd say, security issues, usually around the world. So where do you see that going and where do you see that needing to go? And as an American taxpayer, I'd really like to know because everybody else is cutting their budget, so I'd like to cut ours as well. But just I, I just threw that out there because it's actually something we're talking about a lot in the exercises we run at NDU, which is we are going to have budget cuts somewhere. So how will the regional organizations pick up that slack? So let's take security. Melanie, if you can add one, and we'll even go over here, and we'll try to put the three to the panel. Well, thank you, Tara, for organizing this panel. Thank all of you for your views. It's really a fascinating way to end the day. One thing that has struck me in the course of the day is how much we've learned since uh, David Hammer's Carnegie Commission on Preventing Deadly Conflict about the drivers of conflict, the political and security mechanisms needed to prevent conflict. One thing I'd like to ask you at the end of the day today is what don't we know? That if you as implementers could wave your magic wand and come up with a new program for ABI or for USIP or for the government or for universities, what, what don't we know? What needs more work? Uh, yes, hi, I'm Mindy Reiser, Global Peace Services USA. Somebody once said, let a thousand uh, flowers bloom, um, many ways of thought content. We have a number of organizations working in prevention, International Alert, the International Crisis Group, in some ways, GPAC. And I'm wondering how all this can be mobilized and uh, should it be coordinated? We have resource constraints. Are people really complementing each other in what they do? Do we want this, this wonderful proliferation to continue or are we sometimes tripping over each other? And in a resource constrained environment, how can we maximize the impact of these important initiatives? What I'm going to suggest we do is Firstly, to take these in reverse order and go down the line, um, Michael Lund, the great conflict prevention expert, argues that there's too much political will and that there's a dispersion, that it's spread too thin, and that it's really more an organizational challenge than a traditional political will. So I want to go down the line on political will. Feel free to wrap into it where we go on security and, of course, on the question of what we don't know is going to be your final closing remarks from each of you, which will lead us to Abby's conclusions. So political will, too much, too many organizations, Ed Luck, too many players in a crowded, on a crowded stage. Well, anyone from the U.N. should know about incoherence and lack of coordination. Uh, it's a perennial in the organization, although I think it's actually getting better. Uh, it's a little shocking, but it is, I think, getting a little bit better. Um, I, I, from what we see, um, you know, institutionally, the big question is how do global 
regional and very importantly sub-regional uh, groups interact, uh, particularly on, on mediation, uh, uh, conflict prevention, uh, peace building, this sort of thing, uh, mediation per, per se. Um, and I think a lot more thought needs to be, be given to that. Um, there is more relationship now, for example, between the UN and the AU, uh, not only the Peace and Security Commission uh, Council and the Security Council uh, meeting uh, annually, um, but also desk-to-desk -desk cooperation. And same with, with uh, some of the Latin American institutions and, and certainly with the European ones. Uh, so some efforts are being made, but I think a lot, lot more needs to be done uh, in that area. Uh, I think the, the thousand flowers or hundred flowers blooming uh, is really, I think, much more referring to the civil society efforts. Um, and my impression would be that um, although, you know, I'm saying this from some distance, is that maybe the more the indigenous, uh, very local groups are maybe not included as much as they might be, and, and those connections aren't as good as they might be. I'm not too worried about, you know, 100 global organizations all wanting to do something. In, in humanitarian affairs relief, it's a bit of a mess, but I'm not sure in this area it, it, it is as critical. But I do wonder whether the local forces are being squeezed out a little bit. Uh, the question about what we don't know I think is terrific. Um, uh, I, I, I'm so impressed by what we don't know. I mean, it's, it's so vast. Uh, I mean, I see all this research, I see all the, all the studies, this, that, and the other thing, and then you come to individual situations saying, wow, we don't have the faintest, you know, in terms of what to do about it. Uh, and we see something that works one place doesn't work in the next. I think comparative lessons, uh, cross-sectoral, uh, trans, uh, uh, trans-regional kinds of things, uh, lessons learned are very, very important, um, and encouraging dialogue among these groups. Uh, but I, I think we, we've, we've barely reached the tip of the iceberg on these things. And I think we'll continue to do that. I think it's the nature of the, the problem. It will never quite be solved. I'm not sure which kind of security you're thinking of, Kathy, but when you're talking about it, I was thinking about security of personnel, uh, which is not unimportant. Uh, and the U.N. finds now that there are people, you know, there's a premium in going after U.N. people now, just as there had been with humanitarians and, and others. You know, it's a very different thing than it had been, let's say, 20 years ago. And uh, that inhibits a lot of lot of uh, missions. Uh, it inhibits the mobility of people, uh, getting out and reaching out where they should be uh, reaching out. I think it creates problems for costs, just the cost of the security to begin with, uh, but then you're getting much less utility out of the people that you have. And it's not only your international staff, but very importantly, your, your, the national staff uh, working with, with these kinds of missions are in a lot of trouble. It, it's uh, I mean, if you, when you sit down with all the SRSGs, all the special representatives of the Secretary General, whatever, you know, one of the prime uh, topics of conversation now is, yes, we want to go out and protect uh, uh, people, and yes, we have, uh, you know, protection mandates, et cetera, but we're having a really hard time protecting our own people. And uh, that leads to some very, very unattractive trade-offs. Uh, so in that sense, the, the, the pervasive insecurity is really very striking because in many ways it's the nation-state system uh, which is being attacked by others who simply reject it from A to Z in many cases. And, uh, uh, you know, the kidnappings, the, the assassinations, the, the bombings, uh, the intimidation. I mean, that is deterrence, and it's a very sad kind of deterrence, and it's very purposeful and very targeted. And uh, it's very sad to think that that's sort of what we're getting to in some ways at, at this point in time in, in many places. But uh, that, to me, is, is very, very worrisome. Ambassador Herb's closing thoughts. Okay. Regarding political will, um, there are by no means too many actors, um, official actors in this field. The, the problem of, of global instability is so large, the more countries and organizations that get involved, the better off we are. That's the more partners to address the problem. Um, but on the, on, you might say, the unofficial side, the think tank side, I don't think there's any doubt that this area, um, conflict prevention, peace building, stability operations has been the fastest and strongest growth field in, the, in political science over the past 20 years. And there's certainly some crowding in the field. Um, institutes that are coming late want to get involved, and you find the same themes coming up. So that's just something to keep in mind. There's certainly not too many NGOs in the field that put that in the same category as governmental actors. The more hands we have, the better off we are. Regarding, uh, let's see, the role of security. Uh, since the question came from NDU, the thing that struck me was, once you talk about soldiers, you fail to conflict prevention. Uh, conflict prevention has a very important security element, but again, if you're talking about conflict prevention, that security element would be in the form of trainers or advisors so the locals can maintain a certain level of stability. 
once you have such instability that police cannot do it, then you're into a wholly different circumstance. I agree with Ed regarding the, the question of security of actors in this field, of the people we put into the field. Um, we've been doing a lot of work on that in SCRS. Frankly, the restrictions on State Department, and for that matter, USAID operations, is way too restrictive. We're going to have to move beyond those heavy restrictions. We have to allow a certain amount of risk to put our people into the places where civilian action must be done. Uh, having said that, uh, managed risk is not the same as foolhardiness. And, you know, I, I was in Sudan last week. One of the big stories there was the fact how uh, a couple of folks were pulled, I guess they were NGO workers, were pulled out of a fortified compound in Darfur in the middle of the night. Uh, that shows you how some of the bad guys are looking at targeting, whether it's NGOs or UN workers or, or traditional diplomats who have always been more of a target than the UN and the NGOs. Uh, let me just ask you, I, I want to make sure that I was listening carefully. Are you su suggesting that then prevention, if you work in at the Pentagon, is not, should not really be in your doctrine or thinking or planning because if they get to you, if you get to a uniformed person, it's too late. Should we therefore say prevention is not part of that plate? Our, the, the military, our military, needs to have prevention in its doctrine. and In fact, it does. We've seen all sorts of developments over the past several years. However, I was making the definitional point that once disorder is such that you need troops in to restore it, you're no longer in a prevention situation. But prevention should be part of the doctrine, A, because the military has all these resources which can be used for preventive purposes. Okay. Last item, what we don't know. Again, this field has gotten so much attention, that doesn't mean there can't be more. Um, this is just my personal view, nothing more. And that is that what's most useful are careful case studies of what's happening. And then building on that maybe sort of comparative analyses. Uh, that, that is always going to be useful. This is not a science. It will never be a science. It's an art of the most difficult kind. And the more information you have regarding how people have worked on it, whether for success or for failure, would help um, improve that touch that the guy who's doing the stuff needs to have in order to, to have a chance of success, a chance of success. Heather. On the political will sort of coordination issue, I, again, I, I just I have the Kosovo example uh, in my mind because of our, our discussion with the uh, head of the EU rule of law mission. Um, and he, he anecdotally said, listen, we, we are tripping over each other all day long in Kosovo. We have not only EU, U.S. engagement, we have individual EU member states that are in there, and that's just in the rule of law, sort of that technical advisory. It's always a challenge. I think you ask any serving ambassador who's had to uh, coordinate, coordinate, coordinate. It, it's, you know, so if that's an example of political will, saying I want to be a part of that and I want to send my program there, there's plenty of political will. I would argue there's a lack of political leadership and that, when it comes to, and I take a, I look at transatlantic issues, where is the U.S.-EU strategy about taking Kosovo after the ICJ ruling? Where is the long-term vision? This is going to be a 20, 30-year process of, of integrating the Western Balkans. That's going to require vision and leadership. And that's what I think is missing right now due to, the, understandably, the press of domestic issues and, 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 and other pressing issues. So I, I think we have too little of political leadership to drive some longer-term vision. Uh, what we don't know, oh, dear, that's a, for me, that's too long of a list. But um, the one thing that I've been struck with, and I've taken a, uh, recently, of course, with the uh, uh, recent G8, G20 meetings, I've really taken a look at how the G8 is starting to migrate towards the G20, and I look at that uh, in part under the development assistance rubric. Here you have, you know, like-minded countries spending uh, a great deal of money. Now, some have pledged and not fulfilled. Uh, read Italy. Uh, others have done much better. Read the U.K. Um, but as these issues uh, move in a broader category to emerging economies, are they going to show the same leadership and dedication to these challenges, of which conflict prevention, I agree to Peter's about the MDG, how we insert that, are they going to show uh, leadership as well as uh, perhaps the G8 countries uh, reduce 
uh, their engagement and the G20 come into it. That's a trend I think we just have to watch. We're in this transitional phase, quite frankly, and we're sort of making it up as we go, which is okay, but we'll have to understand what that means. So that's what I don't know and, and I'm watching. And finally, one area that I think on the, on the role of security, and I, I, the U.S. is working on this, the EU is coming to it, is security sector reform. This means working with the security actors, again, encased in a rule of law setting, that helps to work through some of these issues. It can enhance capabilities, but it enhances how we, you enshrine policing, uh, you know, even military, in, in these rules. So when an emergency happens, they have the tools to address it. That may be one area that we want to explore. Lawrence, as we come around full circle to this morning when Mary Yates was here. She talked about the small victory of getting a position at the NSC that I think David Pressman holds for genocide prevention, one of the recommendations that had emerged from the Albright-Cohen effort. And so it raises the question, is one answer to put the right people in the right positions of leadership on prevention-related issues, would that change or would it potentially improve the attention and the operational end of it? I, I don't think we should imagine that there is a, an institutional uh, or a personnel solution to this massive challenge. At the same time, I would say that institutions and, matter, and personnel and the way you structure them do matter and make a difference and can make the problem easier or harder. The more you can incorporate regular processes to raise the uh, not yet crisis situations uh, on people's radars, as Ambassador Herbst was discussing uh, earlier, and try to prompt decision making at earlier stages in the process, the more likely we are to succeed. Um, if I can turn to some of the other questions uh, quickly, I mean, I've been really impressed how much interest there's been from uh, uniform military and uh, Defense Department officials in conflict prevention. Now, they largely think about conflict prevention as in preventing conflicts where U.S. troops might be deployed. But nevertheless, they're trying to wrap their arms around what this concept is and how they can contribute and what does it mean beyond their mill-to-mill -mill relationships and um, training and, and so forth. Um, the related point is I think civilian capacity, to go to Bridget's earlier question, doesn't equal preventive capacity. You can think of lots of civilian capacity we have, which actually doesn't help us do prevention. Uh, and some military capacity um, may actually help us in, in the preventive roles. Uh, to the political will question, I think it's important we recognize that conflict prevention is a political process. We shouldn't imagine, again, that it's a technical process, that if we just had enough scientific studies about what works, that we'll be able to then uh, do it. Um, which I th leads me to the what we don't know. Um, I think as we look at the changing power uh, distribution around the world, it would be very interesting to me to have a panel like this with uh, Brazil, India, China, Nigeria, Indonesia. South what is South Africa? What are their conflict prevention ideas, initiatives? Uh, how do they think about these issues? Um, and I think finally on the what we don't know, even if we don't imagine it's a, a technical uh, or scientific process, we have to try and move beyond the toolbox metaphor, I think, um, and try and strive for strategy development. You know, if we think about uh, foreign policy strategy in other domains, if, whether it's the Cold War deterrent strategy or others, um, it wasn't just a matter of, well, we have a set of tools and then we'll offer them to the policymakers in any particular situation, but there was really hard thinking about uh, what is the influence we have um, using this tool on this particular context, what's the likely counter-reaction of the other actors who have influence, and how do we then kind of put this together, anticipating uh, uh, reactions and counter-reactions into something that looks like a coherent strategy, not a rigid one, but one that can be adapted and, and refined over time. I'm going to give Peter the last word. I think you said you have a 1,000 members in your network. I hope you don't consider them flowers just blooming. But um, where do we go from here? Look, I'm from the Netherlands, <laughs> where the flowers are blooming. <laughs> <laughs> um, 
On the issue of political will and players, um, I don't think that that's the main problem uh, in, in this field, um, and certainly not from a civil society perspective. Uh, if you look uh, again at issues of socio-economic development, health, education, I think there's a lot more overlap there than in this field. I think we, we pretty much have our act together in terms of coordination. Um, can we do better? Yes, but should that be our main focus? I don't think so. Um, Security, uh, I think there's a lot of work still to be done on civil-military dialogue. Uh, there's more happening, and it's not exactly a love affair. But, um, you know, I think there's, there's, there's really the, the, the people need to understand that establishing human security is a joint responsibility. Um, and, you know, coming, that, that sort of leads to the question of, of what do we don't know. The Carnegie Report establishes already, you know, conflict prevention is too difficult, too complicated to do it alone. And if there's anything we have learned since the release of that report is how true that is. So the answer to the question, what do we don't know, is that we have to take it as a point of departure that you cannot know everything all information, all actors, well enough if you engage the complexity of conflict prevention. And it leads to the conclusion that what we need is teamwork, which for me is a better word than multi-stakeholder dialogue. I always get <laughs> lost if I <laughs> use that. <laughs> you know, I mean, for me, it's what I try to establish in my own office and in our relationships. And the teamwork, the purpose of the teamwork is to establish a capacity that is hybrid, a capacity that is able to move from local to national to international level, and a capacity that is able to move horizontally. Uh, and that has to do with, uh, you know, at an individual level, with language capacities, for example. Uh, in my office, I have conversations in six languages going on. And, and you know, that's, that's important. That's, you have to live that reality. You have to live that variety of understanding and realizing if you have a debate on a certain issue that there is always this other truth, always this other point of view, because that is the point of departure of understanding differences and of reconciling conflicts. So that's, you know, I think, uh, the, so for me, that's the answer to the question what we don't know. Thank you. Well, I want to thank this um, very strong panel for all the insights. Um, speaking of teamwork, today's full day was really a team effort, but teams also take leaders. And we've had uh, this day under the wonderful leadership of Abby Williams, who runs our conflict analysis and prevention program and has served in the UN, so has been through lots of team building exercises there, and he has the task of stitching together into a tapestry <laughs> in a very short amount of time all the lessons learned from today so that we can move to the tribute and reception. I want to thank you and for your contributions. Uh, it is no mere formality when I say that we've had a really stimulating and productive conference, and I think the high level of of interest in the conference, we had to stop the responses at 200 because we haven't moved into our new building yet, has been matched by the quality of the, of the discussions. Um, we wanted the central focus of the conference to be on the unique challenges and opportunities associated with preventing the initial onset of full-blown conflict, what is sometimes called primary prevention, uh, because while all conflict management and peace building efforts have a preventive dimension, the importance of primary prevention cannot be overemphasized. And I was pleased that we kept this focus throughout, throughout the conference. We began the conference with a strong message from uh, Ambassador Yates about the Obama administration's commitment to conflict prevention as expressed in the new national security strategy. And also, I was pleased that she emphasized the need to recalibrate the balance um, of policy attention and resources given to conflict prevention, peacemaking, and post-conflict peace building. Tara, our executive vice president, has left. I was going to say that I, I'm sure she'll take that in mind 
in allocating resources <laughs> within the centers uh, here at USIP. Um, but let me highlight some key points, I think, uh, emerging from our discussions. Uh, the panel on regional challenges this morning highlighted um, areas that are at risk of breaking out into large-scale violence, including North Korea, Iran, Yemen, Lebanon, Pakistan, and the Caucasus. And I was struck that there is quite a close symmetry between those areas which were highlighted and the priorities which we have established through our own process uh, for the Center for Conflict Analysis and prevention. I was also pleased that the panel mentioned the importance of paying attention to transnational threats such as the water issue in the Middle East and refugees in the Middle East and the Korean Peninsula. So not just focusing on conflict uh, and country areas but transnational issues as well. <coughs> I think <coughs> it was noted that there are ongoing challenges involved in the advancement of conflict prevention and effective conflict prevention strategies. A number of these were mentioned. The unwillingness of governments to acknowledge that their countries are at risk and that they need help. The interest of certain governments to exploit ethnic social features for political gain and to retain power. The fact that many countries do not have stable mechanisms for political transitions, as in Eurasia. Um, that countries sometimes have outside pe uh, powers which meddle in their countries, and the tension between national security threats and prevention of mass atrocities. But I was pleased that, at least today, there was a clear recognition that progress has been made in the field of conflict prevention, uh, both at the normative level, as Lawrence mentioned with the ECOWAS framework, with R2P within the UN context, with the AU, and the principle of non-indifference. Um, uh, but it was also good that we had examples of cases where prevention was tried, worked, and made a difference. We have the example of Guinea and Kenya, even though Kenya, of course, is, is still at risk of the, uh, for the next election. But Guinea and Kenya were mentioned as places where broad based international effort and organized domestic support contributed to success at difficult times, and those efforts, of course, were Africa-led. And during this panel, we've also had the examples of the EU rule of law mission in Kosovo, the border assistance mission in Moldova and Ukraine, and the EU force in Chad. So we had specific cases of where it has actually worked. I think <clears throat> we got insights into how conflict prevention strategies could attend to cross-cutting challenges. Specifically, with regard to governance, we have uh, the challenges, the five gaps that Ramesh mentioned, the knowledge gap, the normative gap, policy gaps, institutional gaps, and compliance gaps, which are critical in dealing with that particular cross-cutting challenge. A theme that ran through the panels was, of course, uh, predictably, the role of the United States. And the U.S. role necessarily will depend on the challenges of each region and the nature of cross-cutting challenges. And, but the roles of the U.S. would include assessing the extent to which governments are themselves the sources of conflict and a concomitant willingness to confront those governments, working with other governments to forge a consistent uh, approach to countries at risk, difficult but necessary. And of course, in the case of Eurasia, upholding the Helsinki principle that borders must not be changed by violence, but perhaps having an openness to revising Stalinist border settlements through negotiation and supporting a greater cooperation between groups like the Shanghai Grouping and NATO. On the cross-cutting challenge, certainly in the case of non-proliferation, the U.S. role could entail continued support of the NPT and making its application more relevant to the problems of today, taking more practical measures to strengthen the IAEA, and to invest financially 
to secure all the nuclear sites. This would be a relatively low-cost investment which would will, will yield high uh, dividends. And of course on the panel, uh, today Ambassador Herbst has mentioned that uh, the U.S. has developed some tools to improve its capacity to prevent conflict, ICAF for one, the early warning lists, and of course perhaps the potential of the Civilian Response Corps to play a constructive role in conflict prevention. Um, on the uh, final point about uh, USIP, one of the overall goals of the conference was to identify priority areas for USIP's future work on conflict prevention. Looking back and reflecting on our discussions, it seems that we have been able to meet that goal. I think we've, had got, we've got some very good and promising ideas in terms of our future work uh, it was suggested that it would be helpful to develop certain areas, first to focus on issues of perhaps crime and violence which plague, plague countries in Latin America and perhaps in some countries in Africa as well. Guinea-Bissau was an example. Second, perhaps to find a systematic way of capturing lessons of what has worked in conflict prevention in places like Macedonia and the other other less known examples which I have mentioned and capturing those lessons and practitioners who have been involved in those activities. Third, um, over lunch we had a discussion and the suggestion that perhaps we could look at how WAD would establish and identify complementarities among institutions and the comparative advantages of relevant institutions in particular situations. Fourth, I certainly gathered, at least from the, the second panel, we were reminded that economics is critical, but an often forgotten element in conflict prevention strategies. The presence of gro a growing number of young populations in the poorest countries in the world underlines the importance of focusing on economic aspects of conflict prevention strategies. So we certainly, in the center, would have to think about the need to link economics more closely to the conflict prevention agenda. Um, we are, and also uh, another suggestion, of course, from this panel, the role of civil society and civil society networks and their contribution to conflict prevention. Um, and how can these actors, civil society and other actors, do a better job in dealing with problems simultaneously and at different levels? Um, and then, of course, um, finally, we had uh, suggestions, perhaps looking at the role of regional and sub-regional organizations as part of the research um, agenda. Um, Lawrence mentioned that perhaps one would have a, a panel on which would bring together representatives from emerging countries, Brazil, South Africa, and so on, to reflect on their views on conflict prevention. So he has just given himself a task uh, for the future. Uh, and then I think we're going to consider all of these ideas over the coming weeks, and I hope that some of these proposals will be developed at some stage in the future. Finally, let me just make this observation. One of the strengths of the U.S. Institute of Peace is our convening power. We can bring a diverse group of people together in a non-partisan environment to have an open, a frank, and an honest dialogue to generate ideas and to come up with practical proposals to address important and challenging issues. This is both an important asset and our compass. So thank you very much again for your participation.